good morning, everyone. May I have your attention, please? Uh, the marks and uh, feedback for your first coursework were available last week. The second coursework will be available tomorrow morning, and the deadline for submission of your laboratory assignment sheets is at 6 p.m. on 30th of November, which is a week on Wednesday. Before I finish chapter five, are there any questions? Yes, please. Is that lab assessment sheet thing we did in the uh, lab, or is it separate? It's based on the results you collected, the experimental raw data you collected. And this is a very small example at the very end, which is based on your experiment. Any other questions? Right. Um, so the only uh, part remaining from uh, chapter five is related to open thin wall sections subject to bending. I should say this is the hardest part of the course, and it's not that hard, it's not complicated, it's slightly harder than a previous section that we've covered so far. So if you've got a beam which is subject to a pure bending moment, the effect of a bending moment in terms of stresses is normal stresses. So it, the bending moment applies a normal stress on the cross-section, which has a linear variation in terms of y. The y is the distance of any fiber from the neutral axis. M is the moment applied, and I, capital I, is the second moment of area of the cross-section. If you've got a lateral shear force or a lateral distributed load applied to the beam, the beam not only experiences a normal stress applied to the cross-section, it also experiences a shear stress on the cross-section and in the longitudinal direction of the beam. And because a shear stress is always complementary, whenever we have shear stresses on one section or one plane, we have shear stresses acting on a plane normal to the first one. So this is the equation for finding a shear stress because of the lateral shear force. In chapter one, chapter two, we called, uh, or chapter four, when it was subject to the torque, we called them simple shear or pure shear. But when a component is subject to a lateral shear force, the shear stress is called a flexural shear stress. So this is the equation for the flexural shear stress that it's equal to the shear force applied at any section. I is the first moment of area, capital I second moment of area, and B is the width. And I, the first moment of area, is the first moment of area of the section, part of the section, which is enclosed between the top layer or free surface and the section we are interested to find is shear stress with respect to the neutral axis. But the, all the equations we've, got, we've covered so far in chapter five, uh, they are applicable to both thin sections and thick sections or solid sections. For shear stress, we can make some assumptions because for thin sections, we are more interested in flexural shear flow uh, rather than shear stress. On slide 17, which I covered it last week, I showed you that we can find, uh, which can just make a small changes, a small change in this equation. So in this equation, B is the width of the section. So if you're after shear flow distribution or shear stress in a panel which is subject to a lateral shear force, then we can say B is equal to T. Since the product of the shear stress and the thickness is shear flow, so we can convert this equation to shear flow instead of shear stress. As I said, for thin sections, it's better to use shear flow rather than shear stress. And what's the definition of shear flow? Is the force applied per unit length of the section. 
and the unit is a newton per meter or newton per millimeter. Now on slide 17, I showed you that we can find the shear flow distribution of a thin panel subject to a lateral shear force in the Cartesian coordinate system and also in the curvilinear coordinate system. And obviously both of them have show that the shear flow distribution has a quadratic variation on the panel. And as we expected, we get the maximum shear flow on the neutral plane or neutral axis of the beam. Now we move on to a slide in number 18, and that is a shear center, definition of a shear center. This is the example I showed you on a Friday afternoon during the problem solving session as well. This is the cross section of a tube, say it's a cantilever tube, which is subject to a lateral shear force and the force is applied at its side. Very similar to the tube you experimented on a few weeks ago. In your case, a rod of neg negligible weight was attached to the end of the tube and you applied a shear forces at the two ends of the rods. Here I've applied the force exactly on the side of the tube. So in this case, based on the superposition rule, assuming material has linear elastic behavior, we can say solution to this problem is when the force is applied at the center of the tube and when the tube is subject to a torque, and the torque is equal to F times R. So when I apply the force at the center, it has no twisting effect. It only bends the beam, assuming this is a cantilever beam. I apply a force exactly at the center. In the lab, you applied two equal forces at the two ends of the rods. So the resultant force would be at the center of the circle, very similar to what you see on the slide. So the effect here is just bending, here is a pure a torsion. So by definition, the center of the circle is called a, the shear center of the circle. Is a point on the cross section when we apply shear force through it has no twisting effect. So for a circular section, the center of the circle is called the shear center. I repeat, if you apply a shear force through the center of a circle, through a tube which has a circular section, the effect is only bending, no twisting effect. Now when the section has two axes of symmetry, the centroid and the shear center are located at the same position. Centroid and shear center are not the same to two different positions on the cross-section. But when the section has two axes of symmetry, the two are coincident. So for example, for this I section, this panel section, the shear center and center of gravity are the same. When the section has just one axis of symmetry, both of them are located on the axis of symmetry, but they are not located in the same position. For an open section, the shear center is always located outside of the section. Obviously, in this case, the center of gravity is located inside. Or the same as channel section, the shear center is outside, but the center of gravity is inside this channel section. So both are located on the axis of symmetry, but they're not coincident. Obviously, if it has no axis of symmetry, they're not located at the same position. So that is the definition of a shear, shear center. You already know what definition of centroid is. So shear center, a point on the cross section. If you apply a shear force through it, it has no twisting effect. It also called a center of twist when a component is subject to torsion. Any question in relation to a slide 18?
So this is a cross-section. As I explained in this chapter, we only focus on symmetric bending, the sections which have at least one axis of a symmetry. So this is a typical thin walled section which has one axis of symmetry. And based on what I explained earlier, this is an open section and the shear center is located outside of it. So if you're designing this structure and you're after thickness for the required, I mean, the required thickness for load applied to it, you need to know where the position of the centroid is. Obviously, you need to know the position of the shear center as well. So, based on the equation I showed you, if I apply a shear force, say, passing through the shear center, it has no twisting effect. And that is the equation which is valid for a, an open thin walled section which has one axis of symmetry. So, Q is the shear flow at each section, at each point on, on the section. Capital I is the second moment of area. V is the shear force applied at any section. And I which is the first moment of area. Obviously, I is not a constant value. It depends where you're finding the shear stress or shear flow for. This was a definition of the first moment of area. Where does this come from? It comes from chapter three. I is equal to integral of Y dA. Y is the coordinate Y, and a dA is equal to dx dY. So this is a double integral. I've written it as a single integral because I'm using the differential of A, which is the area of this cross-section. So because it is a thin wall section, like what we did in chapter three, we are going to convert this double integral to a single integral. We cannot do it if it's double, if it's thick or solid section. We can only do it if it's a thin section. For an open section, we always locate the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system at the open end, because at the open end is not in contact with any other material, so therefore the shear flow in that location is equal to zero. So it is always better to locate it at the open end. Now if I, open, if I locate uh, this curvilinear coordinate system at its origin at the open end, the length of a tiny element on the cross-section with the length of ds, if the thickness in that location is t, I can say is equal to t times ds. So I can say this double integral, can, this double differential dx dy can be converted to t ds. So this gives us a general equation for finding shear flow distribution for any thin walled section which has at least one axis of symmetry. It says if the section is asymmetric, the equation A is longer than this. You can find it in the book by Megson. But this is at the moment for, it has one axis of symmetry. Now look at this equation at the moment. It gives us the shear flow distribution on the cross section. So this shear force obviously is constant for a particular value of F, F and I are constant but T could be a variable. So we could have variable thickness, like the ones we analyzed in chapter four, which were subject to a talk. Y is a Y coordinate in the Cartesian coordinate, and S is a curvilinear coordinate. So the only complexity about this equation is that we have two different coordinate system. Cartesian and curvilinear. Now, in the examples I'm going to solve for you, we use this equation, but we keep converting y to the curvilinear coordinate system. If you're analyzing an arc section, then a circular section, we can easily convert both of them to curvilinear coordinate system. Similar to what we did, sorry, we can convert both of them to polar coordinates, similar to what we did in chapter four. So say I solve this example on a slide 17 
using the equation of a 2 equal to vi over ib. Now I'm going to solve it using this equation. That equation is applicable for both 2 equal to vi over ib, is applicable both for solid and thin wall sections. This is only valid for thin sections. So we're going to use this time this equation. Now as I said, because we have two different coordinate systems, one y and the other one s, we have to convert one to another. Now look at y. At the moment, if the origin of s is at the open end, so this is s and this is y. You can see y and s coordinates at the moment, both are collinear. They're on the same line, but they have different origins and they have different directions, but they are collinear. They're on the same line. So in that case, I can convert the two. It means if they are on the same line, there must be a linear relation between the two. So I have added these blue lines to these blue lines to the slide number 19, but it also comes in future slides. So y is equal to a s plus b, which is a linear relation. So the next objective is to find these constant values, a and b. Now, I'm going to find them based on the conditions we have here. At y equal to 0, s is equal to h. The whole panel has a height of 2h. So when y is 0, if I am on this coordinate system, s is equal to h. So y equal to 0, s is equal to h. So based on this condition, we can find the value of b, which is equal to h. Now, what is the next one? The next one is at s equal to h, which is this point here, y is equal to 0. So this gives us y equal to h minus s. So I substitute y equal to h minus s in the top equation. Now, in this case, t is constant. So I can remove t from the integral and place it outside. Then we have integral of h minus s ds. Now, a common mistake among your students in exam or the event you're going to do your next coursework is that look at the limits of integral. The limits of integral, the first one obviously is an open end is zero, but the top one is not a constant value. I'm finding the shear flow distribution. I'm not finding the shear flow at a point. So I keep it as is. It's not a constant value. So this is a linear function. The integral of a linear function becomes a quadratic function. T is constant, it can be removed. I is equal to 1 over 12, B, which is T, H, which is 2H cubed. So from there, you can find the shear flow distribution and it is exactly the same as what I showed you on a slide 17. So it has a quadratic distribution. So you can see we have zero shear flow at, the, at one end, and then gradually it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. We've got the maximum arrow here. You can see it's got the maximum value here, sideways. And it gets, again, a smaller, a smaller until it becomes a zero. So you can see the below part is uh, the reflection or mirror image of the top section. So if you're doing it for exam, if I ask you to draw it, so you just need to draw the upper part. You don't need to do the whole thing. The bottom part, because it has one axis of symmetry, is a mirror image of the top part. Any question on the slide number 19? So using this equation, we can find uh, the shear flow distribution of the section. And this is a simple example. Now the next slide, the slide number 20, is how to find the position of the shear center. So this section has one axis of symmetry, the shear center and centroid are located on the axis of symmetry, but they're not on the same position. 
So our objective is to position, find the position of the shear center. What we could do, we could apply a shear force through the shear center. So this is a step number one. We apply, you don't know where shear center is, we apply a force through it. When we apply the force through the shear center, then we can find the shear flow distribution on the section, similar to what I showed you earlier. Now, if this is a shear center and you're applying a force through the shear center, it has no twisting effect. It means only has bending deformation. It means summation of the resultant forces or summation of the moments with respect to any point on the section must be equal to zero. So the external moment is produced by this force, external force, and the resisting moment in the structure can be found using this equation. So say we've got a tiny element on this section with the length of ds. The shear flow in this, using this equation, say we find the shear flow distribution. If the shear flow in this tiny element is q, if I multiply q by ds, what was the definition of q? It was force per unit length. If I multiply by a length, it gives me a force. So q multiplied by ds gives us a force. And this force is, I'm finding the moments of all the forces applied to the section with respect to a point such as O. This is your choice, which point you want to choose. It doesn't make any difference. So this is a force. If I find this normal distance R from the center, which I'm finding the moment with respect to, it gives me a moment, a resisting moment from this tiny element. If I find the resisting moments of all the parts of the section and add them all, or I find the loop, not the loop, the integral of this term from the open end here to the other end, this is the resisting moment from the material. F multiplied by EX is the external moment. So in order for the structure to stay in equilibrium, these two must be equal. Must be equal. So F times EX is the resist external moment, and this is the resisting moment. When R is a variable, R is not a constant. If you're analyzing a circle, obviously, R is constant. But for all the sections except the circular ones, R is a variable. So from this equation, then, we can find uh, the position of the shear center, which is EX. So R is variable. R is the position. When you're using this equation to find the shear center, R is the distance of any point, the normal, the normal distance of any point on that section from whichever point you're finding the moment with respect to. Now, when we do this calculation, we can find out that it doesn't matter the value of F is one newton, one kilonewton, or thousand newtons. They will be eliminated from both sides. It means a shear center is the property of the cross section and is independent of the force applied. So when I say to you that a rectangular section has an area of B times H, it's a property of the section, or the second moment of area is a property of the section. Centroid is a property of section. Shear center is also the property of the section. The shear center can be found using this equation and is a property of a section. So that is slide number 20. Any question or questions in relation to this slide? Yes, please. How are we going to know R exactly? R, which you need to look at the geometry you're analyzing and find R from there. I'll show you a few examples. You're going to show us something happening right now? Yes. So any other questions? Any other questions? So we move on to the next slide. So slide number 21 is actually solution to question 3B. 
I've given it as a lecture slide because all the contents obviously are examinable. It's an exa it could be, it's, it's an, a question as well. So on a slide 21, our objective is to find the position of the shear center of a thin walled semicircular section. So the section has one axis of symmetry. In this example, the thickness is a uniform, so T is constant. So based on what I showed you on previous slide, in order to find the shear center, we apply a shear force through the shear center, an imaginary force. It doesn't matter what the value of F is. It will be eliminated at the end, which I'm going to show you. This is an open section. Obviously, the shear center is located outside of the section. So we apply the force through the shear center, and we use this equation to find the shear flow distribution. T is constant, can be removed from the integral. Y is a Cartesian coordinate, and S is a curvilinear coordinate. The section is semicircular, so it's the best option is to, com to convert both of them to polar coordinates. So if you remember, in chapter 3, we found the position of the centroid of this section and also its second moment of area, if you refer to chapter 3. So this is what we did in chapter 3. For a semicircular section with a uniform th thickness, we have pi r cubed t over 2 as its ix. So ix is done. T is constant, and Y and S can be converted to polar coordinates. So say if I take a tiny element, such as with the central angle of D theta, which is located with the value of theta, angle of theta from the Y axis, which is the origin of this polar coordinate we're going to use, then I can say Y coordinate of this element is equal to R cosine of theta. Ds, which is this red small element, is equal to r d theta. So ds equal to r d theta, y is equal to r cosine of theta, t is constant. So f divided by pi r cubed t over 2, multiplied by r cosine of theta, which is y, t is whatever t is, this is equal to ds, which is r d theta. Now look at the limits of the integral. I keep repeating it. I'm going to do it in the future slides as well. That here, we are after the shear flow distribution. We're not after the shear flow at a point. So theta is a variable. Obviously, the open end is 0. So t will be eliminated with this t. <coughs> R squared, two of them will be eliminated with this one of, uh, two of these R cubed ones. Integral of cosine of theta is a sine of theta, so therefore this is the shear flow distribution for the semicircular section. So it has a sinusoidal distribution. At theta equal to zero, the shear flow is zero. At theta equal 180 degrees, the shear flow is equal to zero. And we've got the maximum shear flow when theta is equal to pi over 2. This is what I expected. It is a neutral axis or neutral plane of the section. So this is the shear flow distribution. Zero values we have here at the two ends. We have maximum at theta equal to pi over 2, which is located on the neutral plane. And it has a sinusoidal variation. Now, if I was asked to find the maximum shear stress, what I have to do, I have to divide a 2f divided by pi r by this a thickness, whatever thickness it has here. So if the thickness is t, so the answer is 2f divided pi r t, which is the thickness at this section. But we haven't found the position of the shear center yet. Now, the force is passing through the shear center. It has no twisting effect. So the only effect is a bending. So the summation of the moments with respect to any point on the section must be equal to zero. So the external force is 
F times EX gives us external moment created. And the resisting moment is coming from the material because of the shear forces applied here. And we use integral of QRDS from S to zero. And that's the equation you said, where R comes from. R depends on the geometry we are analyzing. Now, can I ask what R is for this section? The distance of any point on this section from point O. Is capital R equal to little r? Okay, so if I want to find R for this case, capital R and little r are the same because all the points on this section are located at the same distance from the center because the circle. So for all of them, R is equal to little r. So you can see in this equation, I have got Q, which is, I found it earlier. So this is Q. R is the this distance, which is little r. I'm using the polar coordinates, d s equal to r d theta. Now I'm allowed to add constant values here because I'm after a value. I'm not after a distribution. So the next stage, the integral of sine of theta is minus cosine of theta, which is changing between pi and zero. From there, you can find the position of the shear center. You can see it doesn't matter what the value of f is, it's going to be eliminated from both sides. So f has no effect in the solution. And why? Because shear center is the property of the section and doesn't matter what value of f you're applying. So that is question, uh, slide number 21, I repeat, is also answered to question 3b. None of these equations except this one, so these, this equation is available in your examination data sheet or data sheets and this is also, these two are also available, but the rest of them, you need to do it yourself, you need to find them if you get a question like this in the exam. So only you've got this equation and these two equations in your examination data sheets. Any question in, related, in relation to this slide? Okay. So if you want to a slide at 21, to, sorry, 22. So this is a channel section with the height of 2h and the width of h. It has one axis of symmetry, and it's also answer to question 3a. Our objective is to find the position of the shear center of this channel section. The thickness is uniform. The section is open, so the shear center is located outside on the axis of symmetry. The first stage is to apply a shear force through the shear center. So stage number one. And using this relation to find the shear flow distribution. Now in chapter three, I solved this example for you and I showed you how to find the second moments of area of the section with respect to X and Y axis. And I also showed you how to find the position of its centroid. We don't need the centroid at the moment, but we have already, I already showed you how to find IX. So we've got two horizontal panels here, and we have got a vertical panel. So for the vertical panel, Ix is equal to 1 over 12 T to H cubed. And for the two horizontal panels, we've got, for each one of them, we've got 1 over 12 H T cubed plus H T multiplied by H squared. If I find one of them, I multiply it by two. This is something we had in chapter three. So this is for the vertical wall. V is T, H is 2H cubed, plus two times for one of them, we've got one over 12 HT cubed, and then it's located at the distance of H from X, so it's HT multiplied by H squared. Both of them have the same IX, so I multiplied by two. 
t is small, we can ignore this value. So the answer is 2.67 h cubed t. I've already solved it for you in chapter 3. So this one, this case is easier because t is constant. It can be removed. So I substitute this value in ix. So we end up with this relation now. Now here we've got two different coordinates in the integral. On top of that, we have these continuities at these two locations. For the circle, there was no discontinuity on the cross-section. We could, we could solve the section in one go. In this one, we have these continuities at this position and that in this position as well. For this panel, it's quite straightforward. We have open end here. The shear flow is zero. So I can just find this, the shear flow distribution in this panel using this relation. Now, I cannot use the same coordinate system for the vertical panel. I need a different one. So in that case, I divide this section, this channel section, to three panels. Panel 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 4. And use three different curvy linear coordinates for this. Now, the difference between this one and this one is that at this point, the shear flow is zero because it's open-end. At this point, the shear flow is not zero. Whatever we have from here, we need to find it at this, whatever shear flow distribution we have here. Using the S value at point two, we can find the shear flow in this location, and then we add it to whatever value we get for this panel from this equation here. So I repeat, only shear flows at these two locations are zero. If you're analyzing this panel, the shear flow of this point, this point is shared between these two panels. Both distributions must have the same shear flows at this location. So I start with panel one, two. For panel one, two, <coughs> I'm dealing with this equation now. Y is a constant value. For the whole panel 1, 2, y is equal to h. So therefore, I can say y equal to h, I extract it from the integral, and then integral of ds becomes a linear function in terms of s. So this is the shear flow distribution between 1 and 2. Any question in regard to this equation? So it was 0 at... This point is zero, and using this equation here, I have zero to s. Now, I just substitute the value of y, which is h, at any point along this length, y is constant. Now, because I need the shear flow of point two for the second panel, therefore, I find the shear flow at this point, at s equal to h. If you look at this curvilinear coordinate system, at this point, S is equal to H, which is this distance, H. So if I substitute H in this equation, I get this value of the shear flow at this location. Now I move on to panel 2, 3. The panel 2, 3 is very similar to what I showed you earlier. I say both of them are collinear, S and Y, they're located along each other. The only difference between them is that they have, the differences between them, one is that they have different origins and they have different direction. So using very similar to the one I showed you, Y equal to AS plus B, you can find the relation between Y and S. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to substitute in the top equation so this is what I've substituted, y equal to h minus s. And at point 2, the shear flow is this value. So I'm not writing 0. The other one, I started from 0. But in this one, I, the shear flow at this point is not 0. The origin is here, but because we have shear flow coming from the, like a river, a stream of water is coming here, so it's not zero here, so I've added Q2 at this position. And then I add it to this 
equation y is equal to h minus s. Now it, this becomes quadratic. So that is the shear flow distribution for the vertical panel. Now if you're doing it in exam, I'm quite happy you leave it at this stage. You don't need to find it for the bottom panel because it's whatever you get at the bottom is a mirror image of what we have on the top. It's exactly the same as what you get at the top. However, I'm doing it here for you. So from three to four, we have y, which is equal to minus h. The shear flow at point three can be obtained using this relation. At, on panel two, three, s is equal to two h. So s, I substitute h in this equation. I find q3, which is this value. If you, if you, if you want to take notes, you can put in bracket next to it, s for this q3, s equal to 2h. In order to find q3, I just substitute s equal to 2h in this relation. But because it's symmetric, I can say q2 and q3 are the same as well. So you can see these two must be the same. Similar to what we did for the top, we find the shear flow distribution for the panel, the bottom panel. Any questions in this on slide number 22? It is harder than previous um, slides. I don't blame you, um, you don't, if you don't get it um, straight away, so the, the podcast will be available and Give yourself time to absorb it, to understand it. Any questions? So I found the shear flow distributions. The next stage is sketching them. So on the slide number 23, we start with the linear one on the top. The shear flow at point one is zero. We have got the shear flow at point two. It has a linear variation. So at one end is zero, it's an open end. At the other one, I showed you how to find the value of Q2. So Q, this value here is equal to 0374F over H, this value here. Now the shear flow at this point must be exactly the same on panel two, three. Well, panel 2, 3 has a quadratic variation based on this relation. So we've got this value is exactly the same as this value, which is this one, but we have maximum value when s equal to h on this distribution. And that is what we expect. On the neutral axis or neutral plane, we have the maximum shear stress or shear flow. How do we find the maximum one? I just substitute S equal to H in this relation, and I can find the value of the shear flow at this maximum point. I repeat, how do I find this? A common question among you. How do I find this? I just substitute the value of S equal to H in this relation. So this is the maximum shear stress. Shear flow, if I divide it by T, it gives me maximum shear stress. So as you can see, the bottom one is the mirror image of the top one. So for example, if you have a question similar to this, don't do the rest of it, just do for the upper part. You get full mark for it, don't waste your time. You just do the distribution for the panel one, two, panel two, three, and that's it. If you just sketch it for the upper half, you get the full mark for it. Any question in relation to a slide 23? So on a slide 22, I show you how to find the shear flow distribution for each panel. On a slide 23, I showed you how to sketch the shear flow distribution for each panel. But we still haven't solved the problem because it's asking us to find the position of the shear center. So I have just copied and pasted the figure from the previous slide. Now we are after the position of the shear center. The force is passing through the shear center. It has no twisting effect. So it means summation of all the forces 
internal and external must be equal to zero. Summation of the mo oh, sorry, summation of all the moments. So the best point to find the, as I said, the point o is your choice. But usually find and choose the point which uh, is the easiest one. For example, if I go for point O, because the shear forces in this panel pass through point O have no, they create no moments. So point O is the best candidate. Because we get rid of these the shear forces in the vertical panel. We only have two linear function here, which quite make the problem quite straightforward. So in this case, I have F times ZX, which is the external one, obviously. Now, Q, we've got Q1, 2, and then we have Q3, 4. Could you think, don't say it. Could you tell me what, don't know, don't tell me. <laughs> Just think about it. Could you think what the distance of this, I mean, if I'm finding the moments, what is our value for panel one, two? Just think about it. If I'm finding uh, the moment created by this shear force with respect to point O, I need perpendicular distance of point O from that panel. Just think what R is for panel one, two. So how many of you think R is equal to two H for the panel, top panel? So how many of you think it is H? Excellent. So the distance R, capital R, is the perpendicular distance of this panel from point O, and it is equal to H, and the same as the bottom panel. As you can see, R for the vertical panel is equal to zero, because it is passing through point O. So if I divide it to three, this integral now is divided to three integrals. 1 from 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 1. For the 2, 3, r is equal to 0, and for these two, r is equal to h. So this is a linear function, and if I find the moment created by the top one, I don't need to find it for the bottom one, I'll just multiply it by 2, because these two are exactly the same. They create a couple. So from there, you can find the moment created, and then from there, it gives you the position of the shear center. If the function is linear, you don't need to solve this integral. What you have to do, you need to find this area. It gives you the resultant force acting on this panel, and then you multiply it by this <coughs> 2h. So I repeat, you can solve it this way. I've done it for you on the board, on the slide. But I usually just find the area of this uh, triangle, which is actually this integral. So this area of this triangle. There's another one at the bottom. So if I find one of them and multiply by this distance, it gives me a couple. So this is a couple. We've got one at the top, one at the bottom, with a distance of 2h. That's exactly what you end up with. And from there, you can find the position of the shear center. Any questions? Yes, please. Why do you choose the point over there? As I said, it's, um, it's my choice. You can choose any point on this section. It doesn't make any difference. I choose O because then the shear flow, which is pa on panel 2, 3, passes through point O. It has no moment because r is equal to zero. So it simplifies the solution. However, you can find it at any point on the section, you end up with the same answer. It just makes our life easier if we go for point O. Does it answer the question? Yes, yeah. yes please. So for slide 24, r is equal to perpendicular distance, not complete distance. For all of them, r is called the perpendicular distance of any point on the panel from the point you're finding the moments with respect to. So I repeat, capital R in this equation, in this integral, is the perpendicular distance of any point on the panel from the point you're finding the moments with respect to. Obviously, it depends on where you're choosing your point on the section and how the shape of the section you're analyzing is. Does it answer the question? 
not from the origin, from the point you're finding the moments with respect to. From the point where you're finding the uh, normal stress from? There is no normal stress here. You're working with. Yes, shear center. So I repeat, Q is the shear flow distribution on the section. R is the perpendicular distance of any point on the section from point O. Point O, you choose. <coughs> the point O is, so R is the perpendicular distance of any point on the section with respect to point O. And point O is the point we are choosing on the section for finding the results and moments with respect to. Does it answer the question? Okay, so it's 10.50 now. If you just take a break for 10 minutes, please, and then we come back, please come back at 11. Section. So, when I we consider Q of this section, shouldn't we take the I of this section? No, 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 no. I exist for all the sections. So, for each section, we need to take the I of everything. Yeah, of course. You analyze. That's Q. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. When you're finding Q, Q is for the whole section. Okay. I is for the whole section. But when you're solving that integral, you're dividing okay, this. Okay, so basically the integral is from different sections. No, the, the, the integral is for the whole section. Yeah, but then they're do doing it in different parts. Yeah, but I remains whatever it is. So we have an integral, it's for the whole section. But because the way the section is, you divide so it into three okay. bits. So F and I don't change, do okay. they? And also. <coughs> So, this is how we find the shear uh, center, right? Yes. So, if I say I define a point A somewhere here. What is here? A. Let's say a different point A. A O O. No, like, uh, let's say at this point there's a point called A here. Uh huh. Like, I am defining it. Oh, okay. So, if I find sigma M A equal to zero, will I still get the same answer? The same answer, but it's very, very difficult. Okay. So, in, which, but in theory, you will get the same Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can try, but this is very difficult. Yeah, Don't go over it. Thank you. Thank you.
it's it's eleven, please. So the next example which I'm going to solve is also a channel section, and that is example at 3C. This is also a channel section. It's made of two flat panels and a semicircular panel. The objective is to find the position the objective is to find the position of uh, its uh, shear center. And as we did with the other cases, for finding the position of the shear center, we apply a shear force uh, through the shear center. We find uh, the shear flow distribution because of that shear force. And then finding, by finding the summation of the moments with respect to any point on the cross section, then we can find uh, the position of the shear center. And shear center is a property of section and is independent of the force applied. So here we've got a channel section which has a one axis of symmetry. The shear center is located outside of the section, is definitely located on the axis of symmetry. This is the equation for finding the shear flow distribution. And here T is constant, uniform, so T can be extracted from the integral. So we need to find uh, the value of i, the second moment of area with respect to the x-axis. So here I've divided two, three sections, panel one, two, the curve panel uh, two, three, and panel three, four. So you can see this is the origin of the first panel. This is the origin of the S for the first panel, origin of the S for the second one, and the third one. So Ix from chapter 3 for the semicircular section is equal to pi r cubed t over 2. We've got two horizontal panels which are located at the same distance from the x-axis. So if I find the Ix for one of them, I just multiply it by 2. So it's equal to 1 over 12 at cubed plus at multiply a squared. So this is for... 1 over 12 AT cubed with respect to its own local axis, and then is located at the distance of A, so it's AT the area, multiplied by Y bar squared, which is A squared here. So I multiply by 2, this is a small, so the answer is 3.57 A cubed T. So I substitute 3.57 A cubed T in this relation, T is uniform, these two are going to be eliminated. So this is the remaining part of this uh, equation. I studied panel one, two. This is an open end. The shear flow at this end is equal to zero. Could you think what Y is equal to for panel one, two? Does anyone know the answer, what Y is? Thank you, that's correct. So why is the perpendicular or normal distance of this panel from the <coughs> x-axis, which is, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> so why is equal to a? I stopped in the top equation, and it gives me the linear variation for the shear flow for panel 1, 2. Now, is the shear flow for panel two equal, for point 2 equal to 0? If you think the shear flow at point 2 is equal to 0, please raise your hand. So, if I want to find the shear flow at point 2, well done, it's not 0. At point 2, I sub the value of s equal to a in this relation. So s equal to a gives me 0 to 8 f over a for the shear flow at point 2. So at point 1 is the open end, q1 is 0. At point 2, I am on this coordinate system. In, I'm working at the moment on this panel. On this panel, at this point, s is equal to a. 
So if I substitute in this equation, I get the value of the shear flat point 2. Now I move on to panel 2-3. Panel 2-3 is a semicircular section, so it's better to convert both Y and S to It's a circular section, it's better to come with both of them to polar coordinates. So I assume y axis is a zero theta for this polar coordinate system. So therefore, if I take a tiny element on this semicircular section, y is equal to a cosine of theta, ds is equal to a d theta, I substitute in this equation. And it gives me a sinusoidal distribution. Because at point two, the shear flow is not zero, so I have to add it to this equation. I'm not after a constant value. I'm not after the shear flow at a particular position. I'm after the shear flow distribution. So you can see the limits of the integrals, the limits of this integral. I added this Q2, therefore I assume this is open-end if I add this Q2 to it, so therefore, S starts from zero and ends, as you can see, the upper limit is equal to theta. Integral of cosine of theta is sine of theta, so it gives me a sinusoidal distribution. So I have a linear variation here, and then I have a sinusoidal distribution for the curved panel. Any question on a slide number, on this slide? Yes, please. Why is Q2 different to Q1 to Q2? Why Q2 is different? Yeah, how, how do you, I was trying to get Q1 to 2, but how do you get Q2 on its own? Okay. Are you happy with what I've written here? Or not happy? Yeah. Where does Q2 come from? Um, I don't understand where it comes from. Okay. Do you understand where this equation is coming from? Yeah. Excellent. So we are on this um, panel, one, two. Ignore the curved beds. On this panel, this is the origin of the coordinate system. What is the S coordinate for point one? Zero. Excellent. What is the S coordinate for point two? A. Okay. Do you agree that this gives us the shear flow distribution for panel one, two? Right. If I substitute the value of S equal to A in this relation, uh, okay. do you get it now? Okay. That was a good question. So now we move on to panel 2, 3. So shear flat point 2 is obtained. So it's a constant value for the next variation. Are you happy with this equation as well? Excellent. So Q2 is equal to 0 to 8 F over A. So this is just a sinusoidal distribution. Now look at this equation. At this point on this curve, theta is equal to zero. You agree at point two for in this coordinate system, theta is equal to zero. So theta equal to zero is along the y-axis for the curves panel. At this point, theta is zero and then gradually goes to 90 degrees and 180 degrees. So if I substitute the value of theta equal to zero here, I get the shear flat point two, which is zero to eight F over A. Is everyone happy with what I've written here? Now, can somebody tell me, if I want the shear flow at this position, what do I have to do? Thank you. Excellent. So at this point, theta is equal to pi over 2. So theta equal to 0, then gradually moves to theta equal to pi over 2, and then goes to theta equal 180 degrees. So at this location, theta equal to pi over 2 gives us the shear flow at this location which is a maximum one. So I have just transferred all the values, all the equations to this slide from the previous one. So this is the shear flow distribution. <coughs> What's going on? I'm sorry about that. So this is the shear flow distribution, which is a linear variation based on this equation. And then we have sinusoidal distribution. It shouldn't be a sharp corner. It should be smooth uh, line here. So we've got 
this student size distribution, and we've got this linear distribution, the values, the maximum values, 0 to 8 f over a, at this point, theta is equal to 90 degrees, so it gives us 0 0.56 f over a. Any problem, any questions with respect to whatever you see on this slide? So the previous slide showed you the shear flow distribution or distributions for different panels, and then I've now sketched them for you. So the next stage is finding the shear center. So we use this equation, summation of the moments with respect to any point on the section must be equal to zero. External moment must be equal to the resisting moment. <coughs> Obviously, for this one, point O is the best one. Now, for the top panel, what is R equal to for the top panel? What? Not you. You answered one question. What is R, capital R equal to for the top panel? Yes, please? Very good. What is R, capital R, equal for the curved panel, the semicircular panel. Yes, please? Also, right? A, well done. And obviously, the bottom panel is A as well. So point O is the best candidate for finding the moments with respect to. So for all of them, the distance is equal to A, because this distance is also equal to A. A and A. Now, I substitute the values here. But because 3, 4, and 1, 2 are the same, I find one of them multiplied with by 2. Again, it's your choice. And the other thing I've done here, instead of finding the integrals, because this is a linear variation, I found this area of this tri triangle, which is equal to a multiplied by 0 to 8 f over a divided by 2. So it gives us this area. We have a similar area at the bottom, so if I find one of them and multiply by this distance, it gives me this moment. So this is what I have done here. It seems I didn't activate. Um, Do you need to activate recorder? No, no, don't worry, it will be recorded by the university, don't worry about it. Okay. So if this is uh, the resultant force here, and this is the resultant force here, so the area of this triangle is equal to this resultant force. So this is this area. So the distance between these two is 2a. So instead of solving that integral, what I've done here, I found this area, which is this one. So this is this area of this triangle. I multiplied it by this 2a. Or if you're happy to find the integrals, you can do that. It's exactly the same. You find one of them, then multiply it by 2. Any question? And for this one, is Q23 is obviously a, a semicircular section. So d is equal to a d theta, and the limits of integrals are between 0 and pi. And from there, you find the position of the shear center, which is 1.728. Any question on this slide? Okay. 
Okay, now we move on to the next example. So this example is question number E. It's a still an open section. So here we've got a vertical panel which has been cut in the middle and is made of a vertical panel cut in the middle and a semicircular section. The objective is to find the position of its shear center, so we apply a force through the shear center. It has one axis of symmetry, so the shear center is, it is still open, is outside, and the force is passing through it. So Ix is for a semicircular section, which is pi r cubed t over 2, r is equal to little a. And then we've got two vertical panels, but because the cut is very small, if you find I for the whole panel with, without a cut, it gives you exactly the same answer. So it's 1 over 12, a t times 2a cubed, which is 2.24a cubed t. So I repeat, if you find the I for each of these two individually, add them up, because the cut is very, very, has negligible height, so we can say it's the same, almost the same as 1 over 12 t to a cubed. Now I'm going to divide it to one panel here. So I've got 1, a 2, 2, 3, there is no discontinuity here. And then we have discontinuity at this location, and then becomes 3, 4. So I've divided it to panel 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 4. This is the origin of the first one. This is a cut here, so it's a shear flow here is 0. Then this is whatever we have distribution, shear flow distribution, we find the shear flow at point 2. We add it to the next integral. And I don't, if I was asked to solve it in exam, I don't need to do for the lower part because Whatever we get for the upper part, the lower part will be its um, mirror image. So from 1 to 2, do you agree that Y and S have the same direction and have the same origin? So I can say from 1 to 2, Y is equal to S. It's quite straightforward. You can see both S and Y have the same origin and the same the collinear and the same direction as well. So if I substitute in this, in this equation, I get a quadratic distribution. Now how do we find the shear flow at point 2? If you have no answer, please raise your hand. How do I find the shear flow at point 2? What value do I have to enter in this equation? Not you. What value do I have to enter for S in this equation to find the shear flow at point 2? Yes, please. Uh, S equals A. S equals A. Yes, you're going to soon joining these people here. So S equals to, <laughs> S equal to A. So S equals to A. If I substitute this relation, it gives me 0, 2, 2, 3, F over A. So are you happy with what I've written here? Are there any questions in regard to these two values? At point 1, shear flow is con 0. At point two, the shear flow distribution coming from here, I just substitute the value of S equal to A for point two. Now from two to three, it's better to use, so this is the distribution between one and two. Now between two and three, we use a polar coordinates. Similar to the channel section I saw for you earlier, y is equal to a cosine of theta, d is equal to a d theta. If I substitute the values, I get a sinusoidal distribution. Now some students in exam, if they get the question similar to this one, they start, as, when they're drawing the shear flow distribution, they start with zero value here, which is not correct. At this point, this shear flow and this shear flow are the same because they're at the same location. 
So I don't need to draw the bottom part, it's exactly the same as upper part. Now, where do we, if we want to find the position of the shear center, we need to find the summation of the moment with respect to any point on the section. Just think, and if you know the answer, where, which point is the best point to find the moment with respect to? If you know the answer, raise your hand. Yes, please? Which point? The center of the circle. Very good, that's correct. So the center of the circle is the best point to find the moments with respect to. So the shear flows in these two walls will disappear because both of them pass through point O. So therefore the remaining one will be the shear flow on the curved panel. And what value shall I enter in this equation to get the maximum uh, shear flow in the section? If you know the answer, please raise your hand. What value do I have to enter in this equation for theta to get the maximum uh, shear flow applied on the section? Yes, please? Ninety. Theta equal to? Ninety. Ninety, excellent. So theta equal to 90 is the answer. So if I have and set theta equal to 90, it gives me 067F over A, which is the maximum shear flow on this section. And if I was asked to find the maximum shear stress, I just divided this by the it's a thickness here. Any question on this slide? Now let's find it's the position of its shear center. So, you can see the arrows are very big near the neutral plane, and then gradually become smaller, and zero is at these two locations. So position of the shear center, we've decided point O is the best point. So these two disappear because both resultant shear forces pass through point O, so they just it eliminated. For both of them, R is zero. For this one, R is equal to A. I just integrate it and find the position of the shear center. Any questions? So this is got a quadratic distribution. And the other thing is, at this point, must be zero. So this is tangent at this point. Although it's quadratic, it doesn't go this way, it goes this way. Any questions? And question number F. If you remember, we found the second moment of area of this single cell semi, I mean, fuselage section in chapter three. Now we are going to find the position of its shear center, assuming it's cut at this location. So I, we have the same equation, it's a still open end, an open end section. I divide it to panel one, two, and two, three, and the bottom part will be exactly the same as the top part. So this is the exam question last year. So we need two coordinate system, one is starting at this point and another one is starting at this position. This equation is still valid, it's open-ended, and it has one axis of symmetry. Ix I showed you in chapter three how to find it. So it's your job to find it. If you refer to chapter three, the solution to this one is available. So ignore the position of the cut. The closed one has the same Ix. If this cut is very, very small, has the same Ix as the open one. Open and closed have exactly the same values. 
So i is coming from chapter three. Yes, please. Wait, so you find i x by using the Sokotor method involving. I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, it's because I just wanted to suggest a way to solve to find the height of the member, the straight member. The hypotenuse is a, right? Okay. I. If you um, please refer to chapter 3, I've already solved this problem for you. What I'm saying is that I know at the moment this is an open section, but it's cut. if it's a very small cut, then we can say the ix of this closed one and the open one are identical. So if you refer to chapter 3, you can find ix. Now, any other methods you want to use, fine. You can find your value, compare it with whatever I've done in chapter 3. The answer to this one is already in chapter 3. So I substitute the value of ix. At the moment, the thickness is uniform. So between 1 and 2, do you agree that y and s have the same origins and the same their collinear? So if I can say y is equal to s from 1 to 2, it gives me a quadratic distribution. Now, between 2 and 3, between 2 and 3, the section is semi, it's not semicircular, it's an arc. But the difference between the one we saw earlier, point 2 was located on the y-axis. In this one, 2 is located at this position. So when you're finding the integral, the only difference between the solution of the previous one and this one is that theta starts at pi over 3, which is this angle. So this is similar to the previous question, except the point 2 has the coordinate on the polar coordinates at theta equal to pi over 3. Because if I start the circle at this position, theta would be 0. But it doesn't start at this position. It starts at this location. So theta is equal to pi over 3, the lower limit is th th pi over 3, and the upper part remains a variable. So this is q2, 3. Once I do it, the bottom part will be the same. So this is for the vertical panel, and this is for the arc part of the panel, uh, of the section. Obviously, these two, it's not to a scale. These two must be the same. At this point, we have the same shear flow. So if they don't look the same, it's wrong. So it is this line and this line must be exactly the same length. Now, what value do I have to enter for this point to find the maximum shear flow applied? Theta equal to? Ninety or 180 degrees. Which one is correct? Theta equal to, if this is pi over 3, how much is this theta equal to? Because 180 or 180 degrees. So here I am assuming the origin is at this position. Actually, this is the way I've done it here. So this theta can't be right, the way I've done it. So theta should be. My apology, this is not correct. So this is a fine, but this it starts from here. Yes, that's correct. So this couldn't. I mean, this is this is correct as well, but. Um, That is correct, and you need to find a different value. Both solutions, but the way I've drawn, written a theta as pi over 3, then it should be sine of theta. If you assume theta starts from here, then when you use, uh, to use uh, the value of, uh, at this position becomes minus, uh, pi, minus pi over 6. So the way I've drawn it for you, this is the answer. So I repeat the way I've drawn it for you, then pi over 3 becomes, if I assume this is theta equal to 0, at the theta value of this point, 
becomes uh, minus 30 degrees. But if it is pi over 3, then I am starting from this position, then y becomes a cosine of uh, a a sine of theta, that's correct. ds is correct, this is correct. So instead of sine of theta, you end up with this one equation. So I repeat, if I write as a cosine of theta, s still is correct, then we need to write pi over 3 as minus pi over 6, because it starts at the right end. And then you find the summation of the forces or moment with respect to a point. Obviously, point O is the best candidate. And then just look at the limits here. At S equal to 0, the upper part is equal to A sine of 60 degrees, which is this height. So this is the upper part of S. And then here, it changes between 60 and 180 degrees, if I assume theta starts from the x-axis in the anticlockwise direction. Yes, please. Why isn't the previous one also 2 as well? Say it again, please. The previous one from 0 to a sine 60. Why isn't that also doubled? No, uh, no, 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 no. So look at this here. If I have a full circle, say we've got a section, I mean, the S do file, S do um, document I've put for you online, it's got the solution for you for an arc. Say we've got a circle which is cut at this position. I might draw it for you here if I can. Say we've got where did it go? <coughs> okay, it's here. So say we've got this circle and so this is the x-axis, and this is, say, it's cut at this position, so we've got a little cut here. So in that case, if I draw the y-axis for you, so we've got a cut here. And the, I'm going to find, say we've got this section and the shear center is located at this position. The S origin starts from this point here. So therefore, for this section, this is how I solve it. I assume this is theta. I assume this is theta. And obviously, it's become 90 degrees, theta at this point is 90 degrees, and at this point is 180 degrees. So this is the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system. So now this point here, say we had a full circle here. If we had a full circle here, the angle here would be zero, the angle here would be 60 degrees. Do you agree with me? That is 60 degrees here. So the angle here would be 60 degrees. So, that, so that's why it starts from 60 degrees at this position. So if I move to this point, it becomes 90 degrees and it becomes 120 degrees. So the way I have wrote, written here for you, if this point has an angle of pi over 3, then it should be sine of theta, not cosine of theta, because I'm measuring theta from the x-axis. And the same as this one, this must be, everything else is correct. Now say you assume this is your origin, that the, this angle becomes minus 30, because this is 60, this is 30. So if you go for 
a cosine of theta, everything is fine, except the limit becomes minus pi over 3, and everything else is correct, except this. So does it answer the question? So I repeat, based on the way I've written it, this should be sine of theta, not cosine of theta. I did it for you last night. Any, any questions in related to this example? So I repeat everything is correct, except this should be, these two must be sine of theta. Yes, please. Why do we convert the ds to d theta? Uh -huh. Why do we have only written d theta? We haven't written a d theta. Because this is a mistake. <laughs> so this should be a d theta. Yeah, absolutely right. It should be a d theta. Yes. So I had two mistakes. How many marks do I lose? Two marks or five marks each? Okay. So the first one should be cosine of theta. So this is, is, must be sine of theta, and A is missing here. Is that correct? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Any other mistakes? Sorry, f times ex. Yeah, equals to uh, integral of r q1 to ds. Do we multiply that by 2? Yes. 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 I did a mistake. So I lost a lot of mark. So I have to have. Yes. 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 Thank you. That's correct. Well done. That's very good. So let's correct it. So this is sine of theta. So this is sine of theta. And the other one should be, ds should be ad theta, which is I've written it here. And this one should be two as well, because we've got one here and one at the bottom, and we've got this one as well. So in here, instead of, or instead of solving the whole section, I done, I've done it for the two, three, and one, two, multiplied by two. Or what you could do, you can get rid of these two here and divide it both sides by two. Wait, yes? This, wait, so this is the same thing I was mentioning earlier, right? With the whole no. No, 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 what you mentioned was completely different. Any other questions? Okay. So this is done. Now, this part is not examinable. Again, I put together this last night. I thought perhaps you need to know about it. So if you find mistakes, just let me know. <laughs> so this is a closed section one. Now, say we want to find the position of the shear center of this closed section one. As I it's not examinable. It's just for your information. And we found the second moment of area of a single cell fusilla section in chapter three. Now, in order to analyze it, for the closed section one, the shear center is always located inside the section. Now what we could do, we can cut it open at this location. If I cut it open at this location, based on the equation we had earlier, we can find the shear flow distribution. The Q is equal to F over I, integral of TY dS. So we have the solution for this problem. So I call this QB. Now when I do the cut, assuming the shear flow in the position of the cut is QE, which obviously QE depends on the position of where I'm cutting the section. So in that case, based on the superposition rule, I can say QS, solution to this problem, is solution to this problem when it is cut open, plus QE. So I can say QS is equal to QB, which we did it earlier, plus QE. Now, how do we find QE, the shear flow at this 
cut. Since the force is passing through the shear center, it has no twisting effect. If I have a closed section and I'm passing through a force through it, the rate of twist must be equal to zero. Now we move on to chapter four. The rate of twist is equal to d theta over dz, one over two a, loop integral of g, qds over gt. This is something we had in chapter four. And a is the area enclosed by the perimeter of the section. Now, 2a is constant, so it can be eliminated. And I can expand q, which is equal to qe plus qb. And I keep gt inside the integral because g and t might be different, might be vary, might be vary around, uh, around the section. So in that case, I can say loop integral of minus q e ds over gt equal to q b ds over gt. And from this, I can find qe. Say gt is constant. Therefore, qe is equal to minus loop integral of qb ds divided loop integral of ds. In order to find the position of the shear center, very similar to what we did for the open section. The force is passing through the shear center. If we find the summation of the moments with respect to any point on the section must be equal to zero. From there, you can find the position of the shear center. Now, I, I used to give students to solve it, but 50% of the students found it difficult to do because it's got a lot of mathematics involved. Well, this is just for your general information, and you can find many good examples in uh, aircraft structures by Megson to find uh, the position of the shear center for closed section ones. As I said, if you know how to find the open ones, it's quite straightforward. You can expand it to solve a closed section ones. Are there any mistakes on this slide? Have you found any? Q is the shear. If I cut it open, I assume at this point shear flow is zero. But it's not actually zero, is it? If I cut it, there was a shear flow at this location. I call it QE. So if I cut it here, I will have a different QE. It depends on the position of the Q. So basically, the shear flow at the end is so at the co at, at where I'm cutting it. Now, if I cut it at this position, obviously, QE is different. And the shear flow distribution will be different as well. So if I cut it at this, I mean, my advice to you, always cut it where um, the section is located on the, I mean, the point must be located on the axis of symmetry. Always start it from the axis of symmetry. Any question in relation to this slide? So as I said, I don't ask any question in regard, regard to this slide. Now let's go for this example. And that is a fork section. In not last year, the year before, uh, I think uh, there were two reinforcements on the sections. And part of it was the answer was part, it's very similar to what I'm going to show you on this slide. This is not my solution. I have um, extracted it from one of your recommended textbooks. So the values, numbers, they're coming from that textbook. I haven't cited it here, but it's uh, one of the recommended textbooks uh, in your unit specification document. So we've got a fork section which has one axis of symmetry. It's made of a, a channel section and two horizontal panels. And our objective is to find the position of its shear center. So all the numbers are given. You can easily find Ix for this section with respect to I, with, I mean, second moment of area with respect to the x-axis. This equation is still valid because it's an open section with uh, um, one axis of symmetry. The thickness is uniform. So if I substitute the values, this is the final solution for the whole section. So, one of the students asked me, shall we use I for each of the panels individually? And the answer is no. This integral at the moment I've obtained is for the whole section. But because mathematically we, can solve, we cannot solve it directly, we need to divide the panel to different sections. I mean, the, cha the channel section to different panels. Sorry, I didn't say it right. 
So here, I just solve it. Somebody else has actually solved it. I, I divide it to two parts, upper part. I just solve the upper part. I'll show you the solution for the upper part. The bottom part will be exactly the same. So this is an open end. So we have one origin of a coordinate system here. This is another open end. So we have another origin here for another coordinate system. We have one here, which is at this corner, similar to the examples I solved for you. And we've got an, a corner here, which is shared between this panel, this panel, and this vertical section. So panel 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, and 3, 5. Yeah, I'm going to show you the solutions for these 1, 2, 3, and 4 sections. So starting for 1, 2. 1, 2 is parallel to the x-axis, so y is equal to 35. This is 70, it makes it 35. So it gives us between 1 and 2 a linear distribution. To find the shear flat point 2, s is equal to 20, a subset s equal to 20 here, gives us at s equal to 20, gives us Q2, which is 7.266 newton per millimeter, newtons per millimeter. Now from point 2 to 3 is a vertical panel, x, y, axis and s-axis are collinear, but they have different origins, different directions. So we can find a relation between the two. I showed you how to do it in one of the slides. So y is equal to 35 minus s. So at s equal to 0, y is 35. At s equal to, say, 35, y equal to 0. So this is for this beta of the panel, 2, 3. At point 2, the shear flow is 7266. It gives us a quadratic distribution. Now we move on to panel 4.3. Point 4 is an open section, 3 is not. So 4.3 is parallel to the x-axis, so y is equal to 25. i explain this later on. So y is equal to 25. So if I substitute in the top equation, I, give, I get a linear distribution. Now the shear flow at point 3, because of panel 2, 3, can be obtained by substituting value of y equal to s equal to 10. So this is a 70, 35 minus 25, it gives us 10. So at this distance is equal to 10. So if I substitute 10 in this relation here, I get the shear flow because of panel 2, 3. We call it Q3 prime. So this distance is 10. So this is 35, this is 25. 25 minus 35 gives us 10. So this distance is 10. I've substituted in this relation here, s equal to 10. It gives you the shear flow at point 3 because of panel 2, 3. I showed you how to find the shear flow of panel 4, 3. The length of panel 4, 3 is 15. If I substitute 15 in this relation, it gives you the shear flow at point 3 because of panel 4, 3. I call it a Q3 double prime. Now at this point, we've got two streams, like you have two streams of water coming. You have one river here, another river here, we're joining at this position. So the shear flow at this location is the summation of these two. So therefore, shear flow at point three, because of panel two three, and panel four three is the summation of these two. So at this point now we've got a shear flow of 14.273, the panel 3.5 is vertical. We can say y is equal to 25 minus s. Substitute the top equation, gives us a quadratic distribution. And how do I find the shear flat point 5? 
At point 0.5, a y is equal to 35. If I substitute in this relation, I get the shear flow at point 0.5. I don't think I've shown it on this slide. Any questions on this slide? So I just transferred the results to the next slide. So the first one gives us a quadratic distrib a linear distribution. Between point two and three, it gives us a quadratic one. At point th between four and three, we've got a linear distribution. Then we have at point three, we had 14 something, the shift flow at point three, it gives a quadratic and the maximum value at this point is 17.52 Newton per millimeter, Newtons per millimeter. It's now set at nine minutes to 12. And I also show you the solution. The EX is quite straightforward. Thank you, any questions? So as I said, this is not my solution. You can find it in one of the recommended textbooks. And see you on next Monday. Thank you. Yeah. Are you okay? <laughs> oh, I'm taking this with me. We'll hear you on the way out. Nearly in time. I tell you so because you use it vastly, then you yeah. can tell yourself anywhere you want. Uh, last, last week. I didn't really want to.